Welcome to the Space Dreamers Podcast, a Sumadre production. Welcome to the Space Dreamers Podcast. This is, we are talking about a novel this week, once again, uh, the second novel in the Space Odyssey saga, which is four books. Today we're talking about 2010 Odyssey 2, which is Clark's 15th novel, solo novel. Uh, What year did it come out? It's the first one in the 80s, right? I have no idea. That's a great question. Yeah, 82. Oh, wow. 1982. We have come so far. I know. Since the when 40s. you just said, when you just said, I know. When you just said 15th novel, I was like, wow. Yeah. Um, and then yeah, that's 40 years. Like. Yeah. Wow. Uh, Clark slowed down at the end. Yeah. So. There's fewer books. Uh, I think there's only like one more in the 80s. Yeah. Or two, maybe. I don't know. Um, either way. This is this book I think is very the what's interesting about this book in my opinion is like the opposite reason that the movie's interesting. The movie is interesting cuz it's a complete and total misfire. The book is interesting because it's like everything is just exactly what you would want if you're a fan. So there's not it's almost like it's exactly what we wanted in, from a sequel, from both from that to the movie and to the book. It's exactly what you want in a sequel, but because it's, I feel like it's executed so well that it's almost like not exciting. You get what I'm saying? Like, there's not much to talk about because it's like kind of just more of 2001. It's almost like if you combine the movie and the book of 2001, yeah, you would get this. Because I guess let me let me explain because you're giving me a weird look. I think that when you finish 2001, the movie, right? Mm-hmm. You want to know more. You want like you want oh, answers, yeah. right? Yeah. So you read the book, right? And the book gives you a little more, gives yeah. you some answers. Yeah, it's a little different, but it gives you answers. Mm-hmm. But then, with the this 2010, it's like you get answers to like everything, pretty much. Like if you wanted oh, yeah. more of the discovery, you get more of the discovery. You know exactly what happened to the discovery. Yeah, part of the action takes place on that ship. You find out. Where Bowman went and uh-huh. what he is, you find out what the Star Child is. You find out everything about Hal. Yeah, it's a it's it's a perfect continuation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's that's kind of what I was saying. But it's yeah. almost like because it's so perfect, it's like there's not a whole lot to really say. You know what I mean? Like if if it had gone crazy in some crazy direction, you'd be like, "Can you believe oh, that Clark decided right. to do this?" But it's like I can believe everything he decided yes. to do in this book. Okay, I see you know what, what you're saying? saying. I do see what you're saying now because yes, you're. I totally agree with that. Like, there's nothing in the book that I think. And I remember the when the only time I did slow down, I don't think it's bad, but the only time I did slow down in my reading, like I read it like nonstop mm-hmm. up until Bowman shows up again. Mm-hmm. And then you kind of slows down. I mean, you're getting. Right. OK. And this is again, this another thing I want to say is that it's similar to reading Rendezvous with Rama a second time. Yes. Because the first time you read. 2010 you want answers so you're like what is this new version of david bowman doing correct but reading it a second time you're like i kind of know what this new version of bowman is doing so it's not very interesting to have to read it again yes like those sections i think you read for the answers so once you have the answers it's a little dry Mm -hmm. everything else like the journey to the discovery Mm -hmm. like everything with chandra and hal is super Mm -hmm. fascinating Mm -hmm. like regardless of whether you know what's going to happen yeah and even I mean, even though I kind of knew the the ending, mm-hmm. that was still fascinating, too, to see them kind of unravel, like, what the monolith does eventually to Jupiter. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So. There were lots of things that I forgot about. Yeah. You um, know, that as I was reading, I was like, oh, yeah. And I really like how he brought back Haywood. It's too bad that they didn't get yeah. the same actor for the movie. But I just, I like that character. I don't know why. He's a little more mundane in this one. He's kind of just like your every, I don't know, he's kind of just like the main character. 
Yeah, he's a little bit more. I mean, there's a little bit more mystery to him in the first right, right. one. But yeah. yeah, he turns into just like one of the guys right. in this one. I found myself kind of at one point being like, why is Haywood even with them? Yeah, exactly. You know? Yes. It's to be the main character. Especially, right. Especially <clears throat> there are a few parts where it's like, he's like, I tried to stay out of the way. And it's like. Yeah, exactly. What are you like, doing? Yeah, why are you there? <laughs> yeah. Like, you didn't go the first time. Why would you right. go the second time, you know? Um, but I definitely think this novel has a... It's not quite as epic as 2001. Like, I feel like reading 2001... Oh, yeah. It's like a riveting experience. Yes. No matter how many times you've read it. Yes. This one, it's like... it. There are moments, I think, that mm-hmm. that are like that. Especially like that one I I like made a post on Instagram about when Chandra says, "Perhaps you will dream of wait what what was it again? I'll have to find it. Hold on, <laughs> wait wait. It's like perhaps you'll dream of of Hal, Hal as I often do. Yeah, perhaps you will dream of Hal as I often do. Yeah, talking to Sal. <laughs> yes. Um. Yeah. Like that kind of shit is amazing because yeah. It's like a follow up to the, the the amazing mystery and wonder of two thousand and one. It's like you just get more, of right? That, right? You know. It is funny though, this book as a book is so very different from two thousand one. The structure, the grandeur in a sense of what's happening like there's more action yeah you know it's just it was very it's very i kind of look at 2001 as like almost like edited clark like shaved down clark and this goes back to like full body clark yeah does that make sense? Yeah, like, yeah. Yeah, especially now having read so many of his other books, I think I had a different opinion or I did I I thought of him and his writing differently when this series and Rama were the only things I read. But now that I read like a bunch of other stuff, I'm realizing that like he has a way of doing things. Yeah. And 2001 is the exception, yes. which definitely makes sense because it was written under much different circumstances. Right. You know? And with like an equal input from another human. Correct. You know? Yeah. Um. I don't know. It's hard. It's like, I, I can't complain about this book. No. Because it's just, it really is just more of what, like if you wanted more mm-hmm. of 2001, you yeah. pretty much got it. Yeah. And it's not just like kind of riding on the coattails of the cool things that happen in that. It mm-hmm. like very cool things happen mm-hmm. in this book. Like really crazy shit. Yeah. Um like I love the first uh breaking maneuver. Oh yeah. Just everything about how it's described it obviously is very Clark, you know. But then there's that other element of the um Russian astronaut, the woman who yeah. climbs into his like cubby hammock. Yeah. 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 And just that really like human side of things. It's so totally relatable. You think so? Yeah. Like the circumstance I got, I got to like really imagine going to put myself there. But then that part of it, that like, I'm I'm scared for what's going to happen and I yeah. just need to be with another person and I look at this person as a safe person. Yeah. I I found that like just a wonderful moment. Yeah. I thought it was yeah, I get I guess yeah. Yeah, and it really added to the drama of the event. Yeah. You know, yeah, it's yeah. not just a bunch of people, you know, sterilely sitting back looking at the outputs on the screen, but it was like that, that human element that I was like, Oh gosh. Like, you know, like it makes it a a heavier situation. Yeah. Yeah. It's not just the science. Right. It's the emotion as well. Yeah. 
Yeah. Um, so let's. We should talk about what it's about. So basically, he does mess with the timeline a little bit, in that, like David well, Bowman doesn't leave the monolith until they're there. Remember, the Star Child. Right. Although, yeah, but that that work that doesn't. I thought about that, but it actually works because there's no. You don't remember. Bowman has no idea how long he's been gone or any of that stuff. Right, like, right. there's no. It, when you're reading 2001, you think it's like happening in real time. Right. But I think 2010 makes us realize that what he was out there doing when he was becoming the star child yeah. might have. You know, I mean, what is it? it took ten nine years? years. Yeah. So it's like kind of neat. Yeah. In that sense, like, um, like, like we were not tricked, but like you say, mess with the timeline, yeah, yeah. but he never really established one for us. True. 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 So that's kind of neat. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I did. I think the most important thing to say about about this book is that needs to be acknowledged right off the bat is that Clark follows the movie and not the book 2001 yeah. so a lot of changes are made between the written 2001 and 2010 but this book the sequel is completely faithful to the film yeah which i think is like a, a good marketing idea right more people exactly would want to read a follow-up to the movie exactly you know what i mean yeah um and those those changes were explicitly noted. Like you yeah. didn't have to. There were a couple parts where it was like almost like Arthur C. Clarke was just like re- feeding it to you. Yeah, he gives us he gives yeah. several summaries. Yes, of in case you miss summary. This. That's the word. Yes, exactly. Yeah. And there and and it's funny because for me that was very helpful, even like. I think it was more helpful someone coming off of the book because it puts you back in a, like in a mind frame of the film. Yeah. And it clearly, I also, it clearly is pandering to the film watchers because like the chapter need to know in Mm. 2001 Mm -hmm. is all you need Mm. to know. Right. In order to understand what happened to Hal, but he goes over it again in this book in almost, in very similar detail. Yes. Because it's so it's basically just saying like, because this wasn't explained in the movie. Yes. And if you're reading this, you probably only saw the movie. Yeah. I'm going to tell, you know what I mean? Like, uh, but even explain it. Yeah. But even, <clears throat> even uh, like, it's like anything that was changed, he summarized. Right. Like even the Frank, the Frank pool part. Yeah. How in the, in the movie, he goes after him. Bowman goes after Pool in the pod, but that never happens in two thousand one. The book, really? Yeah, it does not happen. I went back and double checked. Okay, does not happen at all. He what does and he do? actually, well, what's really funny is I remembered. I think one of the reasons why I remembered that change so vividly is because I love the sentiment of the very end of the chapter when Pool dies. Okay. Hold on, wait, I marked it in the thing. Yeah, he says, Hal, he cried, what's wrong? Full breaking thrust on Betty. Full breaking thrust. Nothing happened. Betty continued to accelerate on her runaway course. Then towed behind her at the end of the safety line appeared a spacesuit. Uh. <laughs> One glance was enough to tell Bowman the worst. There was no mistaking the flaccid outlines of a suit that had lost its pressure and was open to vacuum. But then he just calls out, to Frank, he's like, hello, Frank, hello. He never leaves, because if you think about it, that had to happen in, in the movie for the action of it, for the yeah. viewers. But in the book and in reality, nobody would leave the spaceship to go after that. You know, like your training tells you that you can't catch that pod. Frank is dead. Right. And it wouldn't be worth the risk for you to get in a pod and go after him. It wouldn't be right. worth it. So this is that's reality, but what they do in the movie makes for a good viewing experience. Right, right. You know, added drama or whatever. But I the this was the line. 
This was the line, the very last line of that chapter. Frank Poole would be the first of all men to reach Saturn. Right, right. And I just loved that. Like, yeah. that was just like, that was like the last thing, you know, Bone was just like, well, see you later. Yeah. You know? So that's a big change. Um, and then because in the movie he also, when he, remember he can't, he forgets his helmet. Right. So he, there's that whole drama of getting back into the ship. Ship. Yeah. yeah. And so Clark goes through all, which all of that is completely omitted because it never happens in 2001. Right. The the book. Yes. So he has to do like a whole play by play of that. Well, it's good that he does all that because yes. I didn't, I didn't even remember. All right. I remember right. is what he said in this book. Exactly. You know that's, I mean? that's what I'm saying. That's what's like great is that he does those little summaries for all of the little changes yeah. that were made. Dude, it's so interesting. Like, there is no other movie slash book situation that is anywhere like 2001 because of the unique circum- yeah. circumstances from which the movie came about. Right. Like, there's no other movie that, I mean, I don't think, that there, was written that way. There has to be, but, I mean, there has to be. But I don't see everything about it was unique. Like, yeah. you would have to have, like... Kubrick reached out to Clark because of who Clark was. Right. It wasn't just like a collaboration of. You yeah, know you're what right. I mean? It wasn't like, just like a writer and a film director. Kubrick sought right. out the expert in science fiction. Yes. To improve his movie. Yeah. You know, and it's it was. It's I don't think that's been done. And then I mean, and what I'm saying is, additionally, then you have these sequels. Yeah. That I mean, one got turned into a movie, but that was just again, you cannot follow up 2001. No. Even Kubrick couldn't have done it. No. You know? So yeah. even though you have this like amazing template, mm-hmm. you just can't do it. No. I mean, maybe if Christopher Nolan did it, I don't know. So I'm sure someone could do it. But like Yeah. There's just too many no matter what you do, if you're fucking with a classic, yep. people are gonna at the time they're gonna be like, What the hell is this? Yeah. And then when the people look back, they're gonna be like, What the hell was that? Yes. You know what I mean? <laughs> um so it's so like depressingly dark. Dude. I know it's a weird day. Yeah. Um, uh, we could just go. Th- I mean, I have like maybe ten marks in here. Yeah. Because this this was back to Clark's beautiful writing, I think, in several occasions in this book. Oh, absolutely. Like this part right here. Dr. Shiva Subramanian, Chandra Sagaram Pillai, professor of computer science at the University of Illinois Urbana, also had an abiding sense of guilt, but one very different from Haywood Floyd's. Those of his students and colleagues who often wondered if the little scientist was quite human would not have been surprised to learn that he never thought of the dead astronauts. Dr. Chandra grieved only for his lost child, HAL 9000. Even after all these years and his endless reviews of the data radioed back from Discovery, he was not sure what had gone wrong. He could only formulate theories. The facts he needed were frozen in Hal's circuits, out there between Jupiter and Io. Yeah, and then um, I like this part. He paused thoughtfully, took several puffs, then blew a skillful smoke ring that scored a bullseye on Sal's wide-angle lens. A human being would not have regarded this as a friendly gesture. That was yet another of the many advantages of computers. I love the fact that in order to make the plot of this book, the second book, work you had to include Chandra as a character because he's fascinating. I'm sorry, repeat that? Like, I love that in order to make the plot of the book work, you have to include Chandra as a character. Right. So, Because he's a really fascinating person. Yeah, yeah. You know, like when you read the first, when you read the first book, I mean, he's, I don't even think, is he even... No, nothing no. about him at all in the movie. It just says that Hal like came online in Houston or at right. whatever date. In the book, though, there's a, there's a little bit about him, like just saying like that he was, you know, like 
how the yeah like how the computer came to be and that he was the one who did so it's like you would never assume that you'd get any more information but because in order to find out what happens to Hal, you have to have chandra be a part of things so he has to be physically there so he has to be a character and Mm -hmm. i just love that he's a character yeah because he's a great addition to everything he's like the only other on. interesting character on the, yeah in the crew yeah absolutely they're all stereotypes right barely characterized right except for chandra and floyd yes um i have another section i have here page 41 that was the theory checked and rechecked in endless tests and computer simulations but as the ill-fitted discovery had shown so well All human plans were subject to ruthless revision by nature or fate, or whatever one preferred to call the powers behind the universe. That's a great line. Yeah, I like that. Are we just doing like a a reading fest? I love this because I have a couple of really good ones too. Just say the page before you... uh... Oh yeah, that's right, because we have the exact same book. Yeah. That makes things very easy. Uh, Oh... Uh, page 209. Okay. He encountered no other sign of intelligence along the river of lava. Once, however, he saw something uncannily like a crawling man, except it had no eyes and no nostrils, only a huge, toothless mouth that gulped continuously, absorbing nourishment from the liquid medium around it. Along the narrow band of fertility in the deserts of the deep, Whole cultures and even civilizations might have risen and fallen. Armies might have marched or swum under the command of European Tamberlanes or Napoleons. And the rest of their world would never have known for all those oases of warmth were as isolated from one another as the planets themselves. The creatures who basked in the glow of the lava river and fed around the hot vents could not cross the hostile wilderness between their lonely islands. If they had ever produced historians and philosophers, each culture would have been convinced that it was alone in this universe. How each of the events would be its Beautiful. own universe. Yes. Yeah, I remember reading it's just, about that. Just re- like just the way that he writes it. Yeah. I love it. Dude, there's a whole chapter at the end of this book that is like one of the greatest chapters I've ever read. Which one? I- I'll have to find it when we get there, but... Yeah. The Great Game. The Great Game. Dude, the- this whole chapter's f- oh, look. fantastic, Yeah, look, I, yeah. I just tagged the beginning of the chapter. It was amazing. He's incredible. But wait, let's yeah. go. I want to go through some of these so, shorter ones. I mean, we're, or we can talk about yeah, what you no, just read, too. No, keep going. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I don't even remember. I don't have that many, so I kind of want to just read them all. This you don't have like that many the episode. There's like ten of them. Oh my lord! You well, have look, way more look. than me. Look. Okay, but there's only four yeah. between page one nineteen and two thirty. Actually, I think I think my problem with this was I was I was I started like tagging like literally every other yeah, paragraph, yeah. and then I was like, this is ridiculous. <laughs> all right, wait. I mean, this might be good here. The ship. This is page sixty three. The ship had touched down after its initial survey, on one of the few islands of solid rock that protruded through the crust of ice covering virtually the entire moon. That ice was flat from pole to pole. There was no weather to carve it into strange shapes, no drifting snow to build up layer upon layer into slowly moving hills. Meteorites might fall upon airless Europa, but never a flake of snow. The only forces molding its surface were the steady tug of gravity, reducing all elevations to one uniform level, and the incessant quakes caused by the other satellites as they passed and repassed Europa in their orbits. Jupiter itself, despite its far greater mass, had much less effect. The Jovian tides had finished their work aeons ago, ensuring that Europa remained locked forever with one face turned toward its giant master. Oh, good one. Yeah. And, and this is the thing too. Like, so, so you er, a few minutes ago you mentioned you're like, "What's Europa Report?" So Europa Report is a movie that's just oh, fucking movie. late oh. to the party, oh. dude. Clark did it in the '80s, okay? Clark I was gotcha. talking about, dude. Europa ca- became like this thing that people talk about, mm-hmm. like popularly on the internet, mm-hmm. long after 
I read this book. Uh, and 2061, which takes place, there's more parts on Europa. Yeah. So it's like, I just, not that people, it matters. People but, were probably always talking about it. It just became more and more popular. Well, I'm yeah. I'm sure. Yeah. And like, yeah. there was no internet when he wrote this book. Yeah. So the, the idea couldn't spread to like common folk right. like us. Right. So, I don't know. Uh, here, this part is page 70. My voiceover artist is going to be busy this week. <laughs> He became fully awake and realized that his left hand was floating just a few centimeters in front of his eyes. How strange that the pattern of lines across the palm was so uncannily like the map of Europa. But economical Mother Nature was always repeating herself, on such vastly different scales as the swirl of milk stirred into coffee, the cloudlands of a cyclonic storm, the arms of a spiral nebula. Stop it. Like the arms of a spiral nebula and the cream in my coffee. Like, are you kidding? I love that. It's weird that they are very similar. That's I, that's what I mean. Like, it's like, that's why Clark is awesome. Because he writes things like that. A poet and an engineer. Yes. All right, here, here's, let's do another one. Okay. Actually, dude, this one is amazing. In terms of yeah. like, like, if you're like a... Like a thriller writer, this is incredible. This isn't even sci-fi. This is like thriller mystery shit. There is one combination of sounds that every... Hold on. So this is page 73. I'm saying these to remind myself when I listen to this Mm. later Mm -hmm. to know what page to take a picture of to send to the voiceover artist. (laughs) little behind the scenes right there. There's one combination of sounds that every human ear can detect instantly, even in the noisiest environment. When it suddenly emerged from the Jovian background, it seemed to Floyd that he could not possibly be awake, but was trapped in some fantastic dream. His colleagues took a little longer to react than they stared at him with equal amazement and a slowly dawning suspicion. For the first recognizable words from Europa were, Dr. Floyd, Dr. Floyd, I hope you can hear me. That's some ghost story shit. Definitely. Definitely. And like I, dude, so that part, the part where the guy describes his time on Europa, Mm -hmm. like it's so ridiculous that he would like tell the story exactly the way a reader of a novel would like it to be told to them, you know? (laughs) Yeah. But what he's saying is so awesome and fascinating that it's okay. Right. And so, like, and those are the parts, like, unlike the David Bowman sections, Mm -hmm. you couldn't, I would, if I had to work or something, I would be late to work if I, if I had to finish that chapter, you know? Like, whereas David Bowman, it's like, I'll put it down anytime. Right. But when you're reading that part where the guy is explaining what he's seeing on Europa, it's so good, Mm -hmm. you know? So good. And for some reason, man... It's good to reread these books. I thought that that happened in, in 2061. But exactly what he described is what I remember about the alien presence on Europa. You know? I, so now I can't even remember what 2061 is about. I thought 2061 yeah. was about going to Europa and having, yeah. and having the experience that this well, guy explains. So maybe, now I don't remember. But maybe, um, maybe it's like repeated. Maybe they go back. Maybe they yeah. go back and see the scene of the scene of the disaster. Yeah, Dude, that- Be- because I felt the exact same way when I was reading that. I was like, "Oh, I forgot." And then I was like, "Wait, but wasn't this? Wasn't there more to this? Wasn't I this? Because it was like a snippet, a slide in right here." Yeah, and well, I felt like there was more to it. Dude, I don't understand too. Like that whole, like you can forgive a lot of things because it's sci-fi and they're just t- trying to tell a story, but. They all come to the realization of why the Chinese ship is on Europa. They're like, oh, wait, they're going to use hydrogen as fuel. It's like, you morons didn't. This is like your job. You planned this whole thing to come to Jupiter yeah. and you didn't think of that. Yeah. <laughs> like, it's obviously for tension and suspense in the book because it's a book. Right. But you're like, huh? Yeah. Like, you You'd know, think the- it would be like the first thing. Dude, you Because it would have had to have been theorized a million times. Yeah. Like, they know everything about what they're doing. Right. Like they they can do all these amazing things, but they didn't think of the fact that, and all they ever talk about is fuel. 
Yeah. It's like you didn't think about the fuel that's there on Europa. Like, how do you not know that? Yeah. Until another ship does it. This is weird. Yeah, I just loved. I loved that whole that whole part. Um, anyway, when they built the when the Chinese built the ship in plain sight, and then it wasn't until they like brought up the rocket booster yeah. or whatever that they were like, oh, that's not a space station. Yeah. So this book, uh, to get, I'll give like a summary up to the point where yeah, I'm okay. at here yeah. in the in my readings. So basically, you've got. Discovery is spiraling, is is uh, spinning end over end over near Jupiter. Mm-hmm. So the Russians and the Americans combine their efforts on yeah. the Leonov yeah. to go to Discovery and just figure out what happened and also to investigate wherever David Bowman went. Yeah. It's pretty much exactly what you would expect Yeah, at the end of 2001. Yeah, everyone's missing. Yeah. The ship's offline. So obviously we got to send somebody... To yeah. go check out what happened. So they send Dolphin Boy Haywood Floyd Stop off to <laughs> off with the Russians <laughs> to um to discover it. But then on their way, or what, right before that CN takes off? Does it take off before them? No. It takes off after them. But it's just faster? Yeah, it's just okay. faster. Yeah, so then there's this Chinese ship that gets there, is supposed to get there ahead of them. Mm-hmm. But then they realize as they get to Jupiter that the Chinese ship is actually going to Europa, and they're like, oh, it must be to refill their fuel tanks because yeah. of all that water, because of all the hydrogen, I believe. Yes. So then on Europa, one of the crew members survives a wreck, and there's like a giant gelatinous, seaweedy, yeah, like organism. Yeah, creature. It's like, it reminded me of the thing from... Uh, the city in the stars. Yeah, the polyp. Yeah. Yeah. It's like a mass. It has no face or legs or whatever. It's just like a mass of like. Yeah. And I love that there's like that one part where he, there's like, he has like a fire or a light and it, it makes like a circle around the light. Like it's yeah. afraid of the light. Like it clearly, well, it displays intelligence, right? Or something? Yeah. Well, that's the thing is it's like it was. I'm pretty sure it's that it was drawn to the light, but it was also skeptical of it. Okay. Yeah. Because it had lived, it was living in a dark world. Right. Yeah. So then, and the ship gets, the ship sinks, right? Doesn't the ship sink? Does the thing crash the ship? I yeah. What happens. I know. Why can't I? Re- but I yeah. Know. Yeah. It's the, the thing, the European creature yeah. that causes the problem. Right. And that, the whole idea, I mean, at this point, when I read this book, I'd never heard of this, but now I feel like people talk about it. Just the idea that if there's life in the solar system besides on Earth, mm-hmm. it's probably on Europa. Mm. Because Europa has a hot core, mm-hmm. but the outside, the surface is frozen. So the hypothesis is that between the frozen surface and the hot mm-hmm. core is a liquid ocean. Mm-hmm. And it's like probably that's what's happening. Yeah. And it's the same idea here on Earth. You have these vents that uh, yeah. are spewing like minerals and, and all kinds of shit into mm-hmm. the ocean. And you can see on Earth that little like ecosystems form around those yeah. that couldn't survive away from them. Right. So that exact same thing could be happening on Europa. Isn't that awesome? Yeah. I mean, that's why we should say who the fuck cares about Mars and go to Europa. Yeah, that's a good point. Who the fuck cares about Mars, dude? It's a fucking red desert. Well, is I mean, <clears throat> that's like the two reasons for space exploration, finding us a new home or finding someone else's home. Yeah, right. So Mars is finding us a new home, and but Europa would be finding someone else's home. Like, yeah. you know, because th- I feel like those are the two obsessions with space is finding a safety net for the human race and you know, plan B, which is such a joke, um, and finding other life, life. out there. Yeah. yeah. Um, it's really funny, the, the that game that I'm playing, Journey to the Savage Planet, you're yeah. always being told what to do, and, and um, like, your ship has an AI, yeah. and it's this woman's voice. And, like, at one point, you, you gain the ability to... You have a 3D printer on your ship, so you, have, you gain cool. the ability to nice. 3D print a, a, a pistol. Yeah. And so she's like, she says something about like, she's like, this is the most important, the most important tool for any colonizer, a pistol. Oh my Lord. She's like, ooh, that's got some undertones to it. Definitely. Uh, 
the game's very tongue in cheek. It knows yeah. that it's making yeah. these jokes. Um, so, yeah. So that that whole scene is amazing. Yeah. When so, the dude is describing it. Yeah, I love I love that. So he's so the the basically that just gets rid of the Chinese. So the Chinese will not be making it to Discovery before them. That that whole scene allows you to get rid of this the the competition. Rival, yeah. While at the same time showing you that there's life on Europa. Yes, exactly. And they do that because the the guy realizes that he can't take off from Europa, so it's it's just one survivor, and he's basically beaming his final message and description of what he saw right. to the discover or to the Leonov. Yeah. So and then the like that part I don't really remember exactly, but it's cool how they say like he goes on the other side of Jupiter, and it's like that's the last time they'll ever hear from him. Yeah. Because his transmission cuts out. Yeah. Um. So this is another great line, uh, 88. Even now, more than three decades after the revelations of the first Voyager flybys, no one really understood why the four giant satellites differed so wildly from one another. They were all about the same size and in the same part of the solar system, yet they were totally dissimilar as if children of a different birth. So that what I love about that is that that's not sci-fi, right? That's just Clark writing really well about beautiful cosmic things. Yeah, and I love it. Uh, what else? What else we got here? The unexpected discovery of life on Europa had added a new element to the situation, one that was now being argued at great length, both on Earth and aboard Leonov. Some exobiologists cried, "I told you so." pointing out that it should not have been such a surprise after all. As far back as the 1970s, research submarines had found teeming colonies of strange marine creatures thriving precariously in an environment thought to be equally hostile to life. The trenches on the bed of the Pacific, volcanic springs fertilizing and warming the abyss, had created oases in the deserts of the deep. Anything that had happened once on Earth should be expected millions of times elsewhere in the universe. That was almost an article of faith among scientists. Water, or at least ice, occurred on all the moons of Jupiter, and there were continuously erupting volcanoes on Io. So it was reasonable to expect weaker activity on the world next door. Putting these two facts together made European life seem not only possible, but inevitable as most of nature's surprises are when viewed with 2020 hindsight. Okay. Dude. What? This line in the part, I think this is the part where they're breaking, him and the girl. <clears throat> what? Like, bro. What? This is ridiculous. Oh, no, what? With this realization, his pleasure at the unexpected encounter abated somewhat. That did not lessen his responsibility to another lonely human being a long way from home. The fact that she was an attractive, though certainly not beautiful woman, <laughs> barely half his own age, should not have affected the issue. But it did. He was beginning to rise to the occasion. Oh. So maybe that's why I was a little skeptical when you were talking about how tender this moment was. Oh, my God. Because I just remember that line and being like, you like, if you're going to say must... it, just say it. Why say it like that? I must just be at this point in my life just immune to stuff like that. You know, because like inundated on like a daily basis from all the jerk dudes in the world that like. That literally, right, I was just like, oh, he's being a nice person. Like, ignore all of this. Well. Oh, my God. I just think it's, didn't Heather just say something about how Clark's, like, not, he's always kind of vague? Yeah. Like, that's so, that's it's so perfect. vague, but it's yeah. like. No, totally. Why include it if you're just going to, like, whose <sighs> sense of humor is this targeted towards? I don't get it. Like up, I feel like this is for like yeah. uptight people would think that was funny because he didn't actually say it. I guess so. I mean, I was, I guess when I read it, I was more, I think it was, pro you know what probably what, ha what it is, is I was more in my head. I was actually like there. Dude, at, I'm, you I'm, know? I'm not saying what you said about this moment isn't valid. And I also don't think. No, that, but I can't believe I didn't read. I didn't. But 
remember that. I also don't think, I think just the way it was written and imagine Clark writing it is goofy. The situation itself makes sense, dude. Like yeah. if, if you were actually in that situation with that girl, yeah, a man, as a man, like that could potentially happen. Like, you can't control that. That's right. just, you know, part yeah. of, like, your biology. Yeah. But it's just the way he says it. Like, the way he yeah, has I to know. throw it in there like that. It's like... <laughs> and first of all, it's like, if you're if you're a woman, maybe you wouldn't imagine that. If you're a man, you're already imagining it. So don't <laughs> say it. You know? Yeah. That's that's my point. As a ma- As a male. Yeah. It's like, that could be a problem. So don't... I don't need to know about it. I already know that it could be a problem. Oh, my God. That's so funny. So anyway. um, Wow. I'm going to imagine that scene in my head differently now. Who are you going to imagine it as? Which Haywood? The 1968 Haywood or the 1984 Haywood? (laughs) What's that guy? What's that actor's name from Jaws? Rob. Paul Schrader. Wow. Wow. How did he, all he said was shh, and I remembered. Yeah, Paul Schrader. I think. Schrader? I think it's S C H R A D E R, I okay. think. Um, okay, what else we got here? And then, quite suddenly, this is page 114, they had reached the big discolored sphere of Discovery's control and life support module. Only a few meters away was an emergency hatch, the very one Kurnow realized that Bowman had entered for his final confrontation with Hal. I shouldn't have labeled that. That wasn't very exciting. <laughs> but that does illustrate the point that I was making earlier. I mean, that's a perfect It's a remind. He's synopsis. constantly yeah, reminding. Yeah, you're constantly reminding us of what ha- what happened. Which again is good because especially if you engaged in both experiences, the movie and the book, you might get a little confused. Yeah. Yeah. I marked this part way at the end now, 227. I wonder why. Let's find out. Okay. The sphere of consciousness in which he was embedded enclosed the whole of Jupiter's diamond core. He was dimly aware, at the limits of his new comprehension, that every aspect of the environment around him was being probed and analyzed. Immense quantities of data were being gathered, not merely for storage and contemplation, but for action. Complex plans were being considered and evaluated, decisions were being made that might affect the destiny of worlds. He was not yet part of the process, but he would be. Now you are beginning to understand. It was the first direct message. Though it was remote and distant, like a voice through a cloud, it was unmistakably intended for him. Before he could ask any of the myriad questions that raced through his mind, there was a sense of withdrawal. Once more, he was alone. Yeah, I don't know. That's, I mean... Well, it's interesting. What, what You were just reading something that foreshadows what does end up happening to Jupiter. Because they... The point of that is that they deemed Jupiter unable to move forward as it currently is. Right. And... Instead, they're going to, to – we were right back in um, meeting with Medusa because it's the Dude, same. I feel so bad for the creatures. I know. He, like the monoliths get, killed so many creatures right. in order to foster the, the raising of other ones. Right. And so they just deemed that those creatures could go no further, go nowhere else. And so they sacrificed what was – surviving and living on Jupiter in Jupiter, I guess, um, for Europa. Yeah, man. I wish Clark was immortal so that he could write a, a an odyssey about the people who made the, the monoliths. I know. Like, I'm sure there's some complicated shit there. There's, they can't be totally benevolent. I know. You know, like you just got to wonder like what, like, well, I think, I mean, you, <clears throat> Bowman gives us bits of it in his understanding of what they are and and what they do. So th- and I I think 
that is what it is, is it's constantly like, I, I feel like there was a, there was a whole part about it where it's like, they just kind of like, they're used to this. Like they keep fostering life in different places and some of it works and some of it doesn't work. And sometimes they have to make sacrifices and you know, there's, they're still trying to figure it out. Yeah. It's just, I do. And I like, um, hold on. Uh, the, the, basically the sentiment in here is that the creators of the monoliths have discovered that the most valuable resource or not resource, the most valuable thing in the universe is capital M mind. Yes. So that's what they're trying to do. They're, right. they, if they see a, a spark that yes. could potentially turn into a <clears throat> mind fire, yeah, then they help it. Right. And uh, I don't know. It's like, this is all beyond really our abilities as humans and really beyond our comprehension. Mm -hmm. But you just got, I mean, cause every time we think about stuff, every time I think about stuff like this, you can't help but re, uh, compare it to what you know, which mm -hmm. is current day humanity. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I don't know if it's really valid what I think, but I don't know about that. You know, it's the same thing with like when people talk about, the longevity of humankind, like, uh, like the the idea that we need to find a second home if Earth gets destroyed. Yeah, I feel like I've gotten into this, but it's, yeah, like, it, it, why? Like, it doesn't. Right. Why do we have to survive? And why do you have to foster? Like, if you are so high up in the rankings of the universe, mm -hmm. and I would assume based on the fact that this is Clark's universe that there's no God. Mm -hmm then what is the point of bringing up minds? What does that do for anything? Yeah, I know. Like if you're so smart, if you're so high up to the point where you have, as he explains, frozen your memories and your intelligence into light so that you don't have matter anymore. Right. You're like frozen yourself into visible energy. Mm -hmm. Then you must be aware of how the universe works. So then my question would be, why I wish Clark was immortal and could write sequels to answer this question yeah. would be, why are they doing that? I mean, it's the constant, it's, it, it, it brings you back to like being human and, and like, why are we here in another light? You know, it's like if God created us, then like something must have created God. Right. You know what I mean? It's like this constant, you keep going up, you know? So like, why are you fostering minds? For what purpose? Because you're lonely? You know? It's the same question at the end of Contact. It's like, yeah. why the fuck did you send, did you do that? Right. Go through all this trouble. Just like right. nothing came of this. Yeah. But I mean, you, you can't answer that question unless the author makes one up. Because yeah. we don't, we've never met an intelligence like this. We don't, you know, it's not real. Yeah. According to what we know. But that is my question, man. It's like, what is the higher purpose? If you make up god if you make up a god in religion then that's your purpose right yes because it's very defined and it's yes. easy to say oh i'm doing this because god tells me to but if we're talking about but, another form of creation and like yeah the universe then it's like what is the point of doing all well, the things that we do well maybe if it's about mind and you know exploration you could look at it like all these all the life that they foster you could look at it like it's just an experiment that they're that they especially if this is clark's world that they're the ultimate scientists that they want to know everything true and therefore they're making you know they're they're experimenting with everything to see what the universe can create what it's capable of maybe yeah. I just want one of these freaking sci-fi stories to acknowledge, I don't know, to be like, because like every, there's always like some little purpose or, or it's like an alien invasion, like they're bad. Right. But I just want one story where aliens show up and they're like, I guess it would be children, uh, child at end. Yeah. Where aliens show up and they're like, we exist. Yeah. And, and we have these big plans over here. So if any of your humans are interested, come with us. Yeah. And like, but like, it's cool. Like, we're here. Like, you don't enough with the UFO stuff. Right. You know, it, 
It's just frustrating. And I well, and I also kind of like I also kind of like the idea of like of Rama, how it was just like flying through our solar system, like not paying us any mind. Yeah. Meaning that, meaning that nothing that nothing that we could possibly comprehend about the universe could really be the meaning. Like if in the sense of like. If they are a higher, if Ramans are a higher intelligence, they're just flying on by. They don't care about the life on Earth at all, and so that means that there's got to be something more that they do care about. Yeah, yeah. Like you know, we're always looking for a purpose. We're always looking for a reason. You know, like we're talking about, but maybe we couldn't even comprehend what that would be or look like yeah and maybe that's um where clark comes up with the childhood zen like the overmind where it's a giant galactic consciousness you know because that's at least something that we can comprehend yeah it's just it's just interesting Have you ever thought about this? And uh, I don't know. I think it's, um, you know how like the human brain is still kind of a mystery? Yeah. You know why? Why? Because we're using a human brain to try to unravel the mysteries of the human brain. Damn. You know what I mean? I never thought of it that way. Like why would the mind give up? Why would your brain give up its own mysteries like to itself? Like the, the computer doesn't know it's a computer. Okay, you literally just blew my mind. We right? might need to like take a minute while I like resettle myself in reality. I wow. mean, the only advantage you could have would be multiple minds, multiple brains trying to understand a brain in general. Yeah. But you know, it's like Yeah, you're right. The only thing that's going to unlock our secrets would be something that isn't us. That's what I'm saying. That's, or that's what I think. Yeah. Dang. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, okay, we are beyond off topic. Not really, dude. This is the <laughs> point of reading Clark. <laughs> this is the kind of shit that Clark readers think about. I I would hope so. I have. Or I don't know. Probably either this or really bogged down in like the technical mechanics of everything. Yeah. Um I really so let's just talk. I have one more paragraph here that I want to read. Yeah, the great game. I, I'm, maybe I'll ask my voiceover artist if he has time to read the entire chapter. Yeah, dude, because yeah. it's amazing. It is just it's such a phenomenal. It could be a short story. It's like, yeah, dude, and they still watched over the experiments their ancestors had started yes. so long ago. Yes, like every a lot of what we were just talking about is totally in that chapter. Even even without the monoliths, dude, think about that. Like, yeah, what evolution or like what humans, what what we are doing right now as modern human beings is we are watching over the experiments of our ancestors. You oh know? yeah, like that's like I didn't oh. I didn't invent houses. Somebody else fucked around and eventually came up with this thing that we're in. And now totally we're right. now we're watching over these experiments that our ancestors took part in. I mean, the the highly obvious one is like the United States of America. Well, yeah, yeah. Like, is one of the ultimate experiences because it's one of the newer. I mean, experiments, experiments is because it's one of the. It's, it's quite an experience too. Um, <laughs> you know, it's like someone like was like you know, screw all of what everyone's been doing. We're going to come here and we're going to start totally fresh. Yeah. Obviously still influenced, but yeah. Melting pot. Yeah. Um, it's like, yeah. who knows if this is even going to work out? Like, we're lucky so far it has, but dude, it's who so f- knows? Have you ever just like dove into, dude, there's like too much. It's crazy, I guess, maybe the older you get, the more you realize there's not enough time to learn all the things about no. the world. So there's no one who has all the answers because no one no. is smart enough to know everything. You it's know, not, like, it's not even, it's not even smartness. It's not even what you just said. It's not even smartness. Maybe there's someone who's smart enough, but they don't have enough time. Right. 
because we don't have enough time. It's like, I just feel like, and, 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 and I don't want to get like really, I don't want to get like political, but it's like, the, I, I especially think about, and this isn't even sci-fi. I don't know. <laughs> like, dude, when people say like, like if someone were to be like, if someone were to ask me, right. Mm-hmm. Be like, do you like socialism? Mm-hmm. I would say, I don't know because I've never lived in a country that has socialism. Yeah. You know, and like you can sit there and you can read like one news article Mm -hmm. or even a book, not just a news article because of fake news and all that shit nowadays, but like a book about what socialism is like. But like you don't actually know. And every country is different. Yeah. And every situation where like every situation that we have to look back on, even each of those was different. Yeah. It just takes one change. Like, like, yeah, there isn't enough time to go through all the experiments to figure it out. Yeah. I guess that's yeah. And and one of the reasons I say that is because I just feel like every time you think you have things figured out, mm. you turn a corner and you're like, "Oh shit. Mm. It's all different over there." Yeah, it just takes one variable. So I I've been in, I've interviewed um Grim Talon, mm-hmm. who's from Romania. Mm-hmm. And so I went on a tear on the internet learning about Romania. Yeah. Not only just not just because I'm interviewing a guy, but because I played a, another game by a Romanian that like takes place in Romania. Yeah. The focus is not Romania, but that's where it is. And the graphics are so amazing and the detail is so amazing that I'm like, this must be what Romania is like. <laughs> like I had no idea. Yeah. And and I'm looking at like you're in these highly detailed environments. So you're in like a person's house Wow! and I'm looking around and I'm like, this must be what a house in Romania looks like. Right. And then the clothing of the people, like they're out in the country right? or wherever they, I don't know. They're like not in a city and it's not modern. And I'm just Mm -hmm. seeing like, I'm like this, look at this gorgeous clothing. Mm -hmm. And this is Romanian. I have never thought about Romania in my life. Do you like, they have a crazy history, dude. Yeah. They had a dictator from the 60s until the 80s, and they, like, in 89, they caught him. Like, the military turned on him, Mm -hmm. and they executed him, and they've been um, capitalism ever since. Wow. And the way the guy I interviewed, he's like, he's like, yeah, we're modern now. Oh, wow. I was like, what? Yeah. Like, what? But, yeah. There's just so many little things. And I I started watching, I I found this... um, YouTube channel. I can't remember what it's called. It's like it's like I it's like living ironically in Europe. Yeah. And this dude from Serbia just goes to all these different countries and talks about them. Mm-hmm. But what's so interesting is it's from like a Eastern European's point of view. It's like it's not right. even it's it's not even like what you learn about. It's like learning about things from different. Like I feel yeah. like you could fill your whole mind right. Yes. Learning about the same thing. But from 15 different points of view. Different perspectives, definitely. I guess maybe that's to full circle. Like, it's like all these different points of view. Mm -hmm. You could could spend your whole life learning about one thing, Mm -hmm. one event. Mm -hmm. But if you looked at it from every point of view that's ever considered it Mm -hmm. or had an opinion on it. Yeah. Like that could, that would fill your whole life. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Definitely. Yeah. It's, it's amazing. Yeah, that's well, it's funny because I'm kind of going through the same experience right now because um, I'm listening to uh, Serial season two. Oh, and I've never even though even though the Middle East has pretty much like indirectly been a part of my life as an American for years. Yeah. For years. Right. Right. Almost my whole life. Um. I never really cared to be interested in the in the countries themselves. Like I've been interested in the politics and, you know, the events and things like that and and I'm not even and from both sides. Like I, you know, I mean I'm not just looking at it, you know, from like an American point of view, but I never really was interested in the countries themselves and listening to the podcast, it, it makes me want to know more about how 
the world works for all of those people in Afghanistan and Pakistan. And it's just amazing. Yeah. I don't, I don't know how it works either. Yeah. But like the, the, it's, it's just like, but we all, but I guess it's kind of like point of view. We always look at that place from an right, American from one, point of view and, and, and a very so, specific like American point of view. American yes, exactly. View. Like that those people could never like that. They, there's no way they're happy over there living in the desert. Yeah. The fucking military needs to go over there and straighten them out. You know what I mean? It's like, well, it's funny because I mean, I, yes, I know. I definitely, that's the one that's like, thrown in our faces but I have definitely tried to put myself in other positions like you know they're human beings just like me I do the things I want to do because that's who I am and they do the things they want to do because that's who they are but I've never done any like I've never like you, you know like I've looked up about I know the history of Europe and France and Germany and all that yeah but it's like I don't know about those countries where those people are coming from and dude, yeah and that, maybe that's kind of what i was going to kind of getting at earlier was yeah. that like it's like when you think about certain ideas yeah you only think about them in like a narrow way it's like yes it's like if you think about socialism you think of like france you know or like but you don't think about there's like dozens of countries that do it yes. that you just don't know anything about right and like only the ones that like, like make an impact are the ones that like right certain political Mm-hmm. like sides here in the U S they're like, well, look at that country. Yeah. You know, I don't know. It's, 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 I don't know. It's just nothing to do with sci-fi, but As it's to just perspective. And, yeah. And like, and like what the, right. Like why, like, I don't know. Like I love this book and I love everything about it, but at the core of it, it's like, what are the people who made the monolith? Like, what are they doing? Yeah. And I guess you could, I mean, that's, they don't know what they're doing. Right. And it's like their ancestors are the ones or their lineage is the yeah. one that's dealing with it now. Yeah. And so you, I guess to, again, full circle to bring, like that's what we're doing as humans. Yeah. Like this whole planet has been carved up and yeah. fucked with and not in a good ways and bad ways, right. you know, like right. and now we're just here dealing, yeah. dealing with it. Yeah. Doing the things that we're doing because that's what we th- have always done or that, you know, like, th- and dude, like, this is this is what I say, man. This is science fiction. You remove yourself from the situation because you're talking about mm. monoliths mm-hmm. and fake suns and gelatinous creatures, and then but then you turn it back and look yeah. at yourself, and you're like, we're like monolith makers. Yeah, like the monolith is like all of our tools that reshape nature. Yeah, and fuck with things that would go one way, but we came along and made it go in another way. Oh, and yeah. that's what the monolith makers do. Yeah. To think that they, like, you made another sun? Like, did, what, did, well, isn't that right. going to be bad for something? Definitely. Well, I mean, it, was it was bad for all the life on Jupiter. But even so, like, wouldn't that fuck up all the rotation of the planets and shit? Absolutely. I'm, I hope, I'm sure he gets into it in I mean, isn't it going to screw up, I mean, couldn't it potentially even screw up Earth? It's one of the things that he... Yeah, says, he, he talks about that like it's a good all thing. All of a sudden, it's like, you know, more hours in the day and stuff. It, like, there's certain months. Remember, it's like certain months that, yeah. like, the you know, like. It was like certain animals had to adapt. It's yeah. Like, it's like, what? Right. That doesn't sound good. And, like, suddenly, like, you know, everything, usually it's like a gradual evolution. But, like, suddenly, there's another sun in the sky. Right, right. Like, a million years down the road. The monolith people are probably going to have to deal with the repercussions of doing that. Right. Yep. It's the Green Knight. <laughs> anyway. Um, <laughs> wait. So I actually am listening to this book right now on audio called Abundance. I don't love it because mm-hmm. I don't really get it. doesn't really feel like there's a th- main point to the whole thing. Yeah. But one thing he was ta- the author was talking about was. Is this nonfiction? Yeah. Yeah. Was. um how like the way nanobots would work mm-hmm. and it's the reason it's similar it's very similar to the monoliths and how they create they like multiply and cover s- s- jupiter before they turn it into a sun oh yeah that part is so cool in the book yeah like so, when they're when they're figuring it out well he talks yeah. about in it was just weird because i literally listened to this part of the book this morning like after having finished this book oh weird he talks about how like it and he just uses this as an example like if you were to if you were to attempt to change 
the face of the moon, right? Yeah. yeah. Then you would create a robotic organism or like a robot. Yeah. That uses what the moon is made out of to multiply. Yeah. As a source to create more of itself. They call it it's a thing. Yeah, to make it it's so that it's exponential growth. Yeah, it's like a it it's like it has a name. Okay. Like a real name in the book. And this is why like in my mind theory. I can't remember like what goes with I was like, did right. Clark talk about the moon? But no, it was this dude. And it's just fascinating, like now I'm getting confused. Wait, it kind of sounds familiar. Like that was literally in here. About the moon? Yeah. I swear this dude in abundance said it. Maybe, I don't know. It's the same idea though. Yeah, and I remember it has like a an actual name. Like a, it's like a something machines. Yeah, I don't remember. Yeah. So the epilogue, I, I, I have a feeling he wasn't expecting to write sequels after 2010 considering the epilogue is 20,001. You know, you, you you notice that the epilogue takes place in twenty thousand one. Oh, I don't know if I noticed that. Yeah. Oh yeah. Real far in the future. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, I I love and it's like Clark's vagueness, you know. Right. Sometimes doesn't work, but if you're keyed in and you're really paying attention, then it pays off. Yes. The part when he talks about, he talks about basically the point of view of a European. Yes. 20,000 years in the future Mm -hmm. or 18,000 years in the future. And uh, like how, I mean, it's so far in the future that I assumed he talks about the light patterns on the other moons and I was like, that must be other life on those planets that's just further along than them. But then it's like, no. Then you realize that, no, those that's humans. And they're on those other planets, and they're advancing, and they're building yes. cities, and they're just not allowed to go to Europa. Right. And, like, but it's so vaguely explained in this in this epilogue, but it's, like, I'll just read this one part I've marked. He says, The theory that there were indeed other worlds had at last been accepted Though no one except a few fanatics believed that they could be anything like as large or as important as Europa. One lay towards the sun and was in a constant state of turmoil. On its night side could be seen the glow of great fires, a phenomenon still beyond the understanding of the Europans, for their atmosphere, as yet, contains no oxygen. And sometimes vast explosions hurl clouds of debris up from the surface. If the sunward globe is indeed a world, It must be a very unpleasant place to live. Perhaps even worse than the night side of Europa. The two outer and more distant spheres seem to be much less violent places, yet in some ways they are even more mysterious. When darkness falls upon their surfaces, they too show patches of light, but these are very different from the swiftly changing fires of the turbulent inner world. They burn with an almost steady brilliance, and are concentrated to a few small areas, though over the generations these areas have grown and multiplied. Yeah, that's humans. That's the strange manifestation of life. Yes. Yeah, I remember the... um the epilo- like there's beauty in that vagueness but then it's sad wait, wait he goes against this however there is one very potent argument if they are living things why do they never come to europa it's like because daddy doesn't want them to come to europa <laughs> yeah big brother says no yeah and that is kind of, yeah it's like and it's kind of sad they're like how can they don't come visit us i mean that's that's <laughs> that's ding dong humans all the ding dong humans who, who believe that every light in the sky is a ufo that's what they're all thinking, too. Why don't they come visit us? Oh, yeah. Bro, because they're not real. Because they're just lights in the sky. I mean, I don't know that for a fact. Right. But the point is, yeah. maybe maybe the UFOs aren't allowed to come here because we're Europa. Right. Maybe the UFOs are like are like renegade brother brethren of our creators who are like, we really want to go yeah. fuck with them. But then the brothers are like, no, 
Big Brothers. So interesting. Because he mentions too that the and then he and then he confirms it, and he says that those are he says that sometimes they come too close and they explode. Yeah. And those are like he, it says later that it's robot probes, like right. probes that humans are sending. Sending, like, yeah. Like you know maybe Big Brother's not watching anymore, but clearly he is. That's so neat. Yeah. This is a great book, dude. Like this oh, is I know. this is Clark at his best. Is the 2001 saga? Yeah, it really is. Yeah, and it's amazing because it's like what I love about it is it's like on the one hand, like 2001 wouldn't be what it is without Kubrick, mm-hmm. but I think Clark really mm. takes it, and it, it, he doesn't do anything except improve upon it and right. make it and just give you more. Right. So, yeah, he never falters. But he also never tries to like. And I, 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 I lo- it's like that mutual respect that I that I could sense throughout reading that whole book about making the movie mm-hmm. between these two people. He like he never tries to erase anything Kubrick did. In fact, he embraces it. Yeah, and just and just adds to it. Right. So I love that. Yeah. I don't think you could be a watcher of the film and be curious enough to want to read the sequel book. And be disappointed. To yeah, get to I that agree. point, you would be not disappointed. If Definitely. someone forced you to read 2010, you might be like, fuck this. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> right. Yeah. But even then, I mean, like, I I, I, I know it's a follow-up, but the vast majority of this could stand on its own. Yeah. You'd be a little confused about certain things, and you'd have questions, but, like, you could read this and then go back and read 2001. Dude, you could also make an entire... Oh, yeah, like a prequel. Yeah. That would be a trip. You could make an entire movie. I was so amazed at the, how small of a detail this is, but it's so complicated if you think about it. What? The way they tricked um, Bowman's wife, ex-wife. Oh, uh no, uh, girlfriend. His, mo- his girlfriend? Okay. Yeah. Remember they were just girlfriend. He was just the friend when they were childhood friends and then they Dude, were lovers. Think, think about how like how devious humans back on Earth in this universe are. They literally dressed up a, probably an intern yeah. who looked like Bowman yep. to make him look like a ghostly version of Bowman yeah. to show up in front of this lady to get her to admit that this happened previously. Yeah. Like, what the hell? That is so weird. I know. Like, you couldn't, like, couldn't she have just admitted it and said he made up this story about how they had to trick her? Like, I know. That's some weird. That's weird. I'm pretty, I'm pretty sure that, because, like, if her husband was saying, yeah, this happened, why wouldn't she just say, yeah, this happened? Man, that lady probably was like, fuck you, Bowman. And fuck you, news agency. No. Like that, that woman, first she's visited by her dead ex boyfriend. Yeah. Okay. Through the cosmos. Yeah. And then she's tricked by a news program <laughs> into talking. She's, that lady doesn't know what's real now. No. Dude. Poor lady. Definitely. Especially when you find out like about like Bowman's childhood and like she, you know, like it, it's just like all set and the dead brother. And then, and then remember she lies to Bowman and tells him that yeah. her kid is his son. Like what? Yeah, that's a li- that was it's like a lot of weird yeah. details. Yeah, that yeah. Um, so we should say low like actually what happens at the end. I mean, we've said it, but basically, oh yeah, the monoliths. Oh yeah, they get a warning. They get a warning from Bowman. Bowman speaks to Haywood. Remember? Yeah. So well, for a hot minute through Hal, and you're skipping the whole middle part when they do board. Discovery and situate it, and yeah. Shonda starts his work on Hal and brings him back to life. Yeah, not a whole yeah. lot happens. No, because then the whole there's like so much of just like learning about like them living on the two ships and right. that stuff. Yeah, so yeah, that all happens, and then the plan is to leave at a certain time, but yep. then Bowman shows up through yes. Hal. Yep, that whole seems really cool. Mm-hmm. How it's like. Like, this is not a recording, like yeah. that whole thing. So bizarre. And Bowman warns Haywood Floyd. He yes. says, you have to leave here in 15 days. Yep. And then uh, no more 
communications with the monoliths or with Bowman right. or any of that stuff. Yeah. <clears throat> and so Haywood's like, listen, guys, we got a jet. We got to get out yeah. of here yeah. in 15 days. And they're like, okay, dude, no. Yeah. But then the reason they decide to leave is because Big Brother disappears. Yes. And Big Brother is is the thing that took Bowman into it to turn him into the star child, just like in the movie. Correct. It's the the, it's the one hanging out. TMA two orbit. Yeah. 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 So since that disappears, they go. Well, we're here to study that thing. Since it's gone, why not? Let's leave. Yeah. So that's a little convenient. Oh um, yeah, I forgot about the whole like they're still studying the. I forgot about that whole part. Like yeah. while they're like bringing Discovery back on board, and you know, like bringing it and bringing Hal back to life and all that fun stuff. They're also studying probing. Yeah. Okay. Totally forgot about that. And it's funny too, because there's always that idea, right? Of why are human, like, why do we always have to show up to things with guns? Like, why are we so violent? Like, like why, why I think they talk about detonating things on big brother. But in that moment, I was right there with them. I was like, fuck it. Let's see what happens. Exactly. You know what I mean? Right. Like, Okay, yeah. If you're an alien race, the first yeah. like you, the first thing you don't want aliens to see humans as as a civilization that shows up with explosives, right? But then it's like, wh- let's. I want to see what happens if you blow it up. Yeah, because this is like, <laughs> like explosives are powerful. Yeah, you know, it's, it's gonna it's like, get someone's attention. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. I found myself thinking I would like to see what happens. Definitely. Like we're, we've been knocking on the door long enough. It's time to kick it down. <laughs> so, yeah. So then Big Brother turns Jupiter into another sun. Yes. And then there's that whole thing where like in order to um, in order to launch early because they were waiting for the launch window. 15 days is like not enough time. So they have to like piggyback on. So discovery and get how how to comply and then there's like that drama like is hell gonna like break down again and cause havoc and yeah, yeah all that stuff is is interesting i mean i, I feel like yeah we oh yeah over i mean that's the thing is it's really interesting when you're reading it it's really it is funny how like giving a summary sounds boring as all get out but then when you're actually reading it it's yeah. really interesting I agree. I mean, I could have done like, you know, without some of like, you know, Haywood's letters home and stuff. I mean, good Lord. But outside of that, all of the operation, like operational stuff is so interesting. Dude, I remember like when it's, I don't remember it now, but I remember when it first, the thing happened with the wife. I remember, I I remember, I remember thinking, I remember thinking, oh, that happened. And then yeah. every time it was mentioned after that, I'd be yeah. like, I forget what happened because I, I didn't care when it happened at I all. I know. It was so bizarre. Like she found another man, right? N- Something happened where they had to break up. Yeah, no. While he it was, was just, gone. It's like, what the fuck did you expect? Yeah. Wasn't it just that like she just didn't want to like. This is my point. Ha- yeah. It's like so I remember. So every yeah. time they mentioned it later, yeah. I would be like, I don't even I remember what happened between you and your wife, dude. Like, I don't care. Yeah, it was so utter. Like, I I kept trying to, like, figure out what value it added at all. And I couldn't figure that out. Yeah, me either. Yeah. So, anyway, yeah. Um, great novel. And then while all this is happening, Bowman, as a star child, is flying around both the Earth and the right. universe and Saturn. I mean, and Jupiter and Wait, hold everything. On. Isn't there... Isn't- does Hal doesn't he talk to Hal? Yeah, Bowman talks to Hal. Remember? Yeah, Bowman and that Hal. Part is awesome. Bowman sucks up Hal. They like Bowman. They yeah. merge. Yeah. Bowman's like, you're coming with me, buddy. I'm pretty sure Haywood because becomes even becomes what? like a gets sucked in there in the third one. I feel like. seriously. I think I can't maybe I'm wait. dreaming. I don't know. I feel like we're making up our own. Yeah. Um. No, but uh, I love that part because it's like how it, it's it's so nice too because it's like. This little like reconciliation. Yes, like Hal is such an important character, you know, like that he doesn't get left behind. It's just great. And and it really Wait. drives home the other concept that intelligence doesn't have to be um life. Yeah, uh 
Organic? Organic. Yeah. It doesn't have to be. Wait, what do you mean he sucks him up? And why? It, I don't quite remember. He... Like, what, what, what language is used? So, he asks his... Bowman asks his... Superiors. Caretakers, or whoever the hell they are, um, you know, for, like, another favor. And they... So, knowing that Discovery is going to perish in the sunblast... He, like, Bowman, like, acquires Hal's consciousness. Okay. So they are one. Right. They're one? They're one. They're, okay. they're like, you know, like, like he, because, yeah, like, it, and because he's, like, he knows he's going to be lonely. Right. Because the other, the monolith people are, like, taken off to go do other things it's like they did their yes yes yeah and so he he asks if he can have Hal so they're like together yeah a couple which of is so star, bizarre star cruiser buddy which is so funny because like if you think about it Hal's the whole reason Hal murdered him well, actually no I'm sorry he murdered no, Hal he, mur- he murdered Hal. Hal yeah Hal tried to murder him right Hal tried to murder him yeah. like and it's it's like he's like it's the whole reason why the first one was the first story was such a mess, right. you know. Yeah, but it's great. It seems like yeah, maybe the two of them would have got sucked in together. Remember, like if everything had gone correctly in the first one, remember they were they were just going to go investigate. Maybe all three of them would have got sucked in. Yeah, maybe, maybe. A, a triforce. Yeah, of consciousnesses. Yeah, but yeah, you turned them off. Yeah, and Frank was dead. Is he dead though? Oh, stop it! I can't wait. <laughs> right, <laughs> um, dude. Imagine like if someone just totally re- just totally did this whole thing mm-hmm. <clears throat> as a series. Like the complications of the fact, you know, how, like TV shows are always complicated because they're long, yeah. and you yeah. can have relationships yeah. change and all that stuff. Yes, I feel like that would be like some like season three shit. You know, definitely. Where, where like how the thing that was terrorizing everyone yes. in season one yes. becomes like your supporting main character yes i think that would be sweet but that'll never happen yeah it and it, really it's so funny because i feel like i feel like if these if you were to t- this would be a great series to turn into like a series like a s- television series or whatever yeah because you could be more you could be less dramatic and more faithful and scientific. Yes. Instead of, you know, because 2001 is amazing, but it's very dramatic. Yeah. I mean, it is a, a visual splendor. Right. You know, but if you if you stepped back and took it like it was like real. Yeah. Like a real show. Yeah. It would be really cool i agree wait real quick the guy that he has the conversation with the first chapter that he's having a conversation with that guy yeah that's the dude from the movie right the guy in those red chairs the russian guy I'm pretty sure that's who that is oh you think so is this in fact what has happened <laughs> that guy <laughs> well yeah that's because he knows him he's like yeah, yeah friends with him or I whatever he like knows him yeah anyway yeah i love the way this book opens oh dude it's like a spy it's, movie it's, it's so good. sick it's great. Yeah, it's like a James Bond movie or something. <laughs> like having a, a, especially, I mean, this is during the Cold War, too. Right, yeah. And doesn't the movie play that up, Cold War crap? Because when the movie was made, it was also in the 80s. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, the funny thing about that movie is I remember seeing that movie and just being like, no, like this is not at all what I wanted. Or, yeah. But, but, but recently... I've been seeing this crap on the internet, okay? I appreciate the internet because you can put whatever you want on it. And yep. like, if there's an audience, they'll find it yep. and they'll, they'll be down with what you're saying probably. There's been this thing, I've seen a couple of videos recently popping up that are basically claiming claiming that like that movie is like actually good and like it's misunderstood and like it's, it was, it's only bad because you put, because you compare it to 2001. But man, no, it's not. I don't even remember it that well, but like, I don't know. Like, I just I think that movie just is bad. Yeah. I mean, 
it's hard though because like I watched it after reading the book. Never so it's, a good idea. Yeah, I know, and that's what I think what's hard is because then you're looking at it from a totally different perspective. It's also hard too, I think. I think there are good things about it. But I don't think it's a quote unquote good movie. Yeah. Um And it's it's also one of those it's it's I mean it's tough too because it's one thing to say you know, 2001 came out in 1968 and visually, you know, it looks super good and super yeah. realistic. And then you yeah. have, you know, uh, Contact came out all the way in 1997 and it looks worse. It's like you can kind of, you know, you don't know what they were going for with Contact. Right. Maybe it's a different thing. This is the same series. Yeah. And the visual effects are nowhere near as good or in- interesting to look at. Am I correct in saying that? I mean, this, dude, when you watch 2001, besides the outfits, you're like, I have no idea when this was made. But yeah. if you watch, I'm assuming when you watch 2010, you're like, this is an 80s movie. Or am I wrong? Not, I mean, parts of it, okay. yeah. But I mean, then again, 2001 did have like a couple, there were a couple parts about it that really did, only a few, but that really did like date it. Yeah. You know, one of which is when he's chasing after Frank. Right. Which kills me because it's not what goes on in the book. And it would have been better visually, better the way the book goes, but it wouldn't have been as adventurous. Dude, I love the part in the movie, though, where Frank initially gets launched. Yeah. And then, and you hear Bowman. Like, Bowman realizes that Frank is in trouble. Yes. And then it cuts to Frank. And then when it cuts back to Bowman, he's already halfway down the ladder. And yeah. you just hear that blaring sirens. Yeah. I love that shot. It's because like, you're sitting there looking at fucking well, nothing happening. And then all of a sudden, it's like, that dude moves so fast that the shot <laughs> the shot missed him. <laughs> this is not normal for this the past hour of this movie. Well, and it's funny, too, because that's one of my favorite i love when he's bringing the pod back and like the lights and he's like i love that part yeah, yeah. so it's funny because i'm saying like you know there are part like i wish it wasn't the way that it was yeah, but yeah. so anyway those particular parts and i think i feel like there's like a couple other little things it's like that same thing only longer and bigger so it's more obvious that's what she said. But <laughs> longer and bigger and more obvious. <laughs> you look very proud of yourself right now. Cuz you said three things that were I know. Sorry, sorry, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> so <laughs> So um I think that's what makes this the the second movie. You know, if they tone that back a little. Yeah. But they were, I think they were going for bigger and better, and obviously they had the technology to do it because it was years later. Yeah. I mean, I haven't even watched it yet, so we'll get into it when we yeah. record that. I mean, you've episode. seen it, but you have seen not it. recently. Yeah. 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 No. yeah. Are, aren't there dolphins? I vaguely remember that in the beginning he's in his house. Yeah, because there are dolphins in the book. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Any excuse to put dolphins somewhere. Yeah, I just remember like like no part of 2001 takes place on Earth except for the monkeys. So then so that just avoids the whole oh, that yeah, avo- you're right. that avoids the whole what does Earth look like in this future? Mm-hmm. You don't have to depict that. But then in 2010, I remember he's like, oh. isn't there a shower where he's walking down the road? That, yes. And there's like a futuristic car that goes by and it's like that just looks like cardboard over a real car. Yes, I can't believe you just said that because um <laughs> Because at one point, that was the part, that was the part that <laughs> mom looked up and said, <laughs> goes, is this supposed to take place in the future? <laughs> and I was like, that's a complicated question because. Technically, no. Right. <laughs> like, and I'm like, but we're watching it like, you know, like, I'm like, but it already happened. But like, that was before and like, not now. Like, it was, it was funny. You could say it's supposed to take place. 
68 to 2001 would be what? 33 years. Yes, it's yeah. 33 years. Yeah. So then plus 10, 43 years. It takes place 43 years in the future. Yes. From now. Right. Whenever now is. Yeah. Um, okay, so I highly recommend this book. Totally. Highly, highly recommend it. Highly recommend it. Better, better if you, like, you know, that's a little weird because what? if you were, I was just about to say, just read the book, skip the movie, but then you might, how confused do you think you would be? If you didn't know the movie existed, right? And you read the first book and then the second book, you'd be like, huh? Saturn? Jupiter? What? Yeah, you would be a little confused. Again, this is a unique series. Definitely. Dude. Very unique. Definitely. It's almost like it, you could, like, like we were saying, like I said, like you could read this on its own and be okay with like a lot of it, but you'd have a lot of questions because there is that yeah. summary. Yeah, yeah. There, you know, there are parts that are the summary, but you would definitely need to see the movie yeah i also yeah, it's love like, i love everything about this book dude i love the cover I know. the colors the purples and the blues yeah it's so dope um but i think i think yeah i think in like you i think like you have to watch and read 2001 together you have yeah. to do it you can't have one without the other Dude, I love. Okay, the back of this book is hysterical. It's like, what is that? okay, just it's it says it says uh, a host of questions has grown more insistent through the years. Oh yeah, who or what transformed Dave Bowman into the Star Child? What yeah. purpose lay behind the transformation? What would become of the Star Child? <laughs> what alien purpose lay behind the monoliths on the moon and outer space? What could drive Hal, a stable, intelligent computer, to kill the crew? Was Hal really insane? What happened to Hal and the spaceship discovery after David Bowman disappeared? Perfectly valid questions. Yes. And then, would there be a sequel? Yeah. It's like, uh. You're holding yeah. it. <laughs> it. There would be one. <laughs> you know what? You know, it's like, you know what? You know what questions I answer? Yeah. Do I exist? <laughs> you know? Right. Yes, I you do. I think, <laughs> therefore, I am. Exactly. Yes. It's kind of funny. Oh, I found it, by the way. Okay. The part that we were looking for, they're right. called von Neumann machines. Got it. And I think I made the, no, you, no, that's what it is. It says, suppose you had a very big, this is 297. Suppose you had a very big engineering job to do. And I mean big, like strip mining the entire face of the moon. Wow. Yeah, right? I, my brain is falling apart. Apparently. I think it might be. You could build millions of machines to do it, but that might take centuries. If you were clever enough, you'd make just one machine but with the ability to reproduce itself from the raw materials around okay. it. Okay, literally don't ever listen to anything I ever say because <laughs> I, I never apparently know what I'm talking about. It's, th it's there. No, really what it is is just don't ask me to cite my sources. The book that I'm talking about, <laughs> Abundance, definitely talked about nano <laughs> robots. Yeah. And the, 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 I get the point I'm trying to make is that I listened to that part. Yeah. Within the same like three hours that I right. read this, well, and and that's why I was that's why I wanted to find what it was called because it's obviously a concept, you know. Right, right. Yeah, that's so funny. Yeah, just just you know, just the source citing is a little shaky. Yeah, but... I'm, I'm gonna edit that out. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, no, I don't think. No, you don't need to because I mean, it's. I'm just kidding. I don't. Yeah, you retain the information. You just forgot where it came from. Right. <laughs> Well, that's the problem when you're playing six video games yes. at once. You're reading yes. a book, listening to a book, yes. watching movies. Yep. Actually, I, haven't, I don't really watch movies anymore. Because but, um, you're attempting to take in as much as you possibly can in your, your small time here on well, this planet. Not only that, but I'm also for the <laughs> first time since I'm like working for myself, yeah. realizing... What people say when they say there's not enough hours in the day. Really? Or like, yeah. how did it get so late? Yeah. Like, I never used to think that. Yeah. Like, when you have a job yeah, on you your have... day off, you just you just literally, you just don't have to really do anything except right. for maybe a couple chores. Yeah. But like, there's no day off when you work for yourself. Isn't that crazy? Yeah. It's like liberating and frustrating at the same time i yeah. would imagine yeah it is yeah uh yeah so that pretty much wraps this episode up i'm really i'm pretty excited now to read 2061 because i 
some of the things that happened in this, I remember happening in that. And I've, right. I've always said, actually, and mm-hmm. I've always thought that that was that the third one's my favorite. And yeah. now I don't remember why. Well, let's find out. Yeah. But next week, we're going to be talking about 2010, the movie. Yeah. And then after that, we have the songs of distant earth. Ooh. Interesting. Uh, and then 2061. Oh, nice. And then two non Odyssey books. And then the final Odyssey. Nice. Yep. I'm excited to watch when we read uh, The Hammer of God. Yeah. Which is like 200 pages and the the font is like bigger than my... Like 14 point? Yeah, it's huge. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so that's about an asteroid headed to Earth. Oh, cool. So I can't... We're going to watch that movie Greenland. What's that? It's like a new asteroid coming to Earth movie. Oh. Who, and... Who's Gerard the guy? Butler. Yeah, that's right. And okay. like no one talked about it. Interesting. Yeah, but like yeah. it looks like it's got like, competent visual effects. I'm pretty nice. excited. I think it's on HBO. So anyway, cool. uh, wait, can I tell you about a podcast I just discovered? Oh, definitely. Yes. Dude. Okay. It's so funny. Yeah. So it's not sci-fi, but it's a podcast. Yeah. It's called <laughs> Smut Club 1990. Oh, boy. Okay. The, You know I love gimmicks. Yeah. Love gimmicks. Gimmicks and boundaries, okay? Okay. To see what you can do within the gimmick and the boundary. Definitely. So I listened to the first episode, which is just the front cover. So Okay. <laughs> basically, it's these two Australian guys yeah. who happen to be comedians. Yeah. They, one of them took a laboring job. That's yeah. what he called it. Yeah. To clearing out a, an estate. Mm-hmm. Someone had passed away. Yeah, <clears throat> and it was he said it was a hoarder's house. Oh gosh! And they, he said that they had like a room's worth of porn, <gasps> magazines. Wow! And he said he found this one magazine called The Picture. Yeah, <laughs> it's it's so it's soft core porn. Okay, from the early nineties. Okay, in Australia, <laughs> and so the whole podcast is them flipping through the book no. and just talking about what they read and see. Oh, my God. And it's so funny. I bet that is. And it it's funny because they're funny. Yeah. Because yeah. they're comedians. Right. Yeah. But, like, you know how it's, like, infectious when people laugh? Definitely. These dudes, like, they can't get through, <laughs> like, two sentences without just laughing. <laughs> it's so funny. That's and so awesome. The, so that what they have, it, it's, uh, it's called The Picture, yeah. which is weird. Yeah. And it's... From 1994, and like he he's like he's like I took a stack from this house because oh the boss God. said that we could take whatever we want because it's all going to the dumpster. Right. He's like I probably took 05 percent of the collection. Wow, <laughs> so funny. Yeah, that sounds awesome. It's it's what a great gimmick. Yeah, exactly. I love it's it. a gimmick. It's like yes. two comedians. Yeah, all you can talk about is a porno, a softcore porno right. mag from 1994. That's awesome. Like, what could you talk about? <laughs> it's hilarious. So anyway, nice little plug from for the Smut Club. There. Yeah, right. Okay, so join us next week. We're talking about 2010, the year we make contact. The film from, I believe, 1984. It's a quick turnaround. I have no idea. Pretty sure that it was yeah, that, that is quick a quick turnaround. turnaround. Wow, yeah. And uh, after that, we got the songs of Distant Earth. So stay tuned for those. And... Uh, Thank you so much for joining us and um, trying to think of a reference to the book to end it on. All these worlds are yours, but stay away from Europa. Yeah. Make no landings there. Yes. Attempt no landings there. Yes. All right. What up, Space Dreamers? Thank you so much for joining me once again for another episode of The Space Dreamers. Uh, I don't think it's any secret that the 2001 Space Odyssey saga is one of the main, main, main reasons that I started this podcast. I love all things Arthur C. Clarke, but like most people, I was introduced to him via 2001. I got to give a huge shout out and thank you to Amy for joining me on this uh, on this episode, talking about 2010 Odyssey 2. We got two, 2061 and 3001 coming up in the weeks to come. Uh, also next week, don't forget to tune in for our very funny uh, episode all about 2010, the year we make contact, the highly questionable film adaptation of this novel. Uh, So thank you, Amy, for joining me today on on this episode. 
uh, and listening to my mad ravings about Smut Club 9090. I also have to give a huge shout out and thank you to Kevin Lesage for making all of the music that you hear in this podcast. Also a massive shout out, massive thank you to Misha Krilov for doing my voiceovers for this uh, for this episode. There were 11 separate passages and he did the turnaround in less than a week. He gave me these passages like four days later. So thank you so much to him for doing that. He's an amazing voiceover artist. If you're interested in getting him to do your voiceovers or any kind of voice work, hit him up on Twitter at M-I-S-C-H-A-K-R-I-L-O-V. Find him on Twitter there. That's pretty much it. Like I said, join me next week for a pretty funny episode all about the film 2010, the year we make contact. Um, And we only have a few more episodes left, honestly. Maybe like five more episodes after this. And that'll complete my saga of reading every single novel by Arthur C. Clarke in one calendar year. So that's actually kind of awesome. So... Yeah, stick around. Stay tuned for like five more episodes. We got the Songs of Distant Earth. We have the Hammer of God. We have the Ghost from the Grand Banks. Additionally, two more novels in the Space Odyssey saga. So join us for all those episodes. Thank you so much for joining me for this episode. No ads in this episode because I had so much voiceover work. Um, But yeah, thank you so much. And join us next time. Later. This has been a Sumadre production. Thank you for joining us.